All right, so in the last section, we focused on sample spaces that had um, equally likely outcomes. So now the question becomes, well, what if all events are not equally likely? So it turns out that our formula stays the same. So the probability of an event E is the number of ways that E can happen, or the number of favorable outcomes, divided by the number of events in the sample space. But as we're going to discover, the counting may not be quite as simple. So we'll need to use the counting techniques that we covered in chapter seven. So remember when we were talking about combinations and permutations and all of those fun things? Well, they're making a comeback right now. So example one, a bag has two black, four white, and three orange marbles. If Samantha draws three marbles at random, find the probability Samantha draws all of the black marbles. Okay, so now, unlike our previous problems, not all probabilities are equally likely. When she first reaches into that bag, how many marbles are there going to be in there? Well, there's two black, four white, and three orange. So there's going to be not, um, nine, right? So to draw a black marble the first time, she would have a two in nine chance. But then there's only going to be eight marbles in the bag. And she may have drawn one already, right? So the probabilities are going to depend on a lot of other things. Luckily, we've already talked about some methods to help us do this. So she wants to draw all of the black marbles. And how many marbles in total are we drawing? Yeah, we want to draw three marbles. And out of those three marbles, what do we want? We want all of the black marbles. So thinking back to our choose functions, right? Because there's no order implied here. She's just picking three marbles. So the order doesn't matter. What do we want that set to consist of? Two black, and do we care about the third one? No. Not at all. So how many ways can she pick the two black marbles? Well, how many black marbles are there? Two. two. So there's going to be two choose two ways to pick both black marbles, then how many non-black marbles are there? Seven. seven. So there's going to be seven choose one ways to pick a non-black marble. Right? So then the total number of ways that she can pick three marbles and have that constraint, so she can pick two black and one of any other color in two choose two times seven choose one ways. So that's going to be the number of ways that she can pick the two black marbles, right? So how many ways can she pick three marbles out of this bag? You can choose three marbles in, well, how many marbles were there in the entire bag? Nine, nine, right? So she can choose any three marbles in nine choose three ways. 
So then going back to our formula for probability then, the probability of her picking the two black marbles is the number of ways that she can do that divided by the total number of events in the probability space, right? Well, this is the number of events in the probability space, and this one is going to be the number of events in the event E that we are looking for, right? So the probability that she draws the two black marbles is going to be 2 choose 2 times 7 choose 1 divided by 9 choose 3. Is this. So grabbing our calculator, we're going to put in the following. So we get a fraction. And we're going to have 2 choose 2. Remember, our choose function is under math, and then probability, choice number 3. So 2 choose 2 times 7 choose 1. all divided by 9 choose 3. And we get 1 twelfth. <coughs> that gives us that the probability that in this bag of nine marbles, if she picks three of them, that she gets all of the black marbles will happen with a probability of 1 12th. So, not a huge number, about 8%, 8 and a little bit, is the probability that she would reach in and get those two black marbles if she picked three at random. All right. So to recap, what did we do? Using our counting principles from chapter seven, we had to decide, well, what was the number of ways that she could pick both black marbles? There were two, and she needed to pick both of them, so that was two choose two. Then she still needed to pick any one of the other marbles. And since that didn't matter, there were seven choose one ways, and the seven there, we'll notice, was the remaining marbles in the bag, because we've already used the two black ones. Then we had to find the total number of ways that she could pick three marbles from the entire bag of nine. So that's nine shoes, three ways. So that gives us the event E divided by the size of the probability space is our probability that she would do so. All right, let's take a look at our next one. So in this one, we're asked the following. So a fair coin is flipped 10 times. What is the probability that at least two of the 10 flips are heads. So let's unpack this statement a little bit. So when it says at least two of the 10 flips are heads, what does that mean? So when it says at least two, that means our event E that we're trying to find E is two heads or three heads or all the way out nine heads or ten heads. So to find the probability of E using the direct method, what would we have to compute? The number of ways she could flip two heads the number of ways she could flip three, three. 
all the way up to 10, and then add all of those up. So using this, the probability of E can be broken down into those simpler events. So the probability of two heads plus the probability of three heads plus all the way out to the probability of nine heads plus the probability of 10 heads. While you can do it this way, the direct approach is a terrible idea. Because if we look at this, it says the probability of at least two heads. Well, what is the complement of at least two heads? So what would be the complement of this event. So the complement E prime would be zero heads or one head. So if I were to calculate the probability of the complement of this event, how many things am I going to have to calculate this time? Just two. If I try to do it directly, how many things am I going to have to calculate? Well, eight, right? So that's going to be a lot, or nine, I think, technically. Um, nine events. So the complement is really a better way to think about this. All right, so now we know that we have a fair coin and we're going to flip it 10 times. So let's kind of analyze what's happening. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So we know that we have 10 stages, right? So let's look at our first one. So for zero heads, what would our event need to look like? Well, what would need to go in every one of those empty spaces? Well, if I got zero heads, what does that mean all of my coin flips had to be? Zero. Had to be tails, right? So I'm going to have tail, 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 because there's only two choices on a coin, right? Heads or tails. So if I have zero heads, that means each one of my 10 spots need to have a tail. Okay, well, if you think about that in terms of our probability space, how many ways can I roll or can I flip 10 tails? Just one, right? Because every coin flip has to be what? Tails. So this can happen in only in only one way. Okay. And if we want to do one head, what is that going to look like? So right now, this time, I'm going to put the head first, but that's only one possible way for that to happen. I could flip a head, and then what would my next nine flips have to be? Tails. But that's not the only way I could get one head, right? What would my next one look like? Well, I have tails, then I flip a head, and then what would all the rest of them have to be? All tails, right? So we could continue to go through and enumerate them like this, but let's use a counting principle to help us figure out what's going on. So how many heads do I have? One. And how many spots do I have? Ten. 
does the order that I put the head, I'm arranging one head and nine tails. Does the order matter? No. Well, I think it does. Because when the head's first, is that different than when the head's second? Are these two events the same? No, right? So they happened in different ways. The first event was I flipped a head and then nine tails. What's the second event? I flip one tail, one head, and then I flip eight more tails. Are those two things the same event? No. The result is I have one head, but those are two different things. So if I continue to just list all of these, how many of these things am I going to have? 10, right? But since the order matters, you know, we keep going on. So since the order matters, so since the order matters, this is a permutation. And we want to know, well, how many ways can we rearrange this? Well, our permutation is going to be 10p1. How many ways can we arrange that head into 10 different places? And then with all the tails, right? So 10, or 10 permute 1 is going to be just 10, but let's verify that on our calculator. So we go 10, math, and permute 1 gives us 10. So there are 10 of these. And as I mentioned, if we just kept doing this, moving the head over 1, and we did that for all of them, we would count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 possible arrangements by just directly counting them. But it would be a little more complicated if we were arranging two things. Then you would really, really want to use the permutation formula. So then our event E complement that we have here is zero heads or one heads. So we can get zero heads in only one way, and we can get one head in 10 ways. Well, how many ways can we flip one coin 10 times? Or in other words, how many events are in the sample space? Well, once again, we have our 10 spots, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Well, if we think of this as a 10-stage experiment, how many outcomes are there for the first flip? What are your possibilities? Heads or tails. So how many outcomes are there? Two. And in fact, since we're flipping a coin, there's always two outcomes. So 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. 2, 2, 2. So in other words, there are 2 to the 10th power events in this probability space. And 2 to the 10th power is 1,024. So then this tells us that the number of events in our sample space is 1,024. So then our probability of zero heads is going to be the number of ways we could get zero heads, which was 1, over our sample space, which is 1,024. The probability of getting one head, we said there were 10 ways to do that. So that's 10 over 1,024. So the probability then of E complement is equal to the probability of zero heads 
plus the probability of one head. So that's going to be 1 over 1,024 plus 10 over 1,024. So we get 11 over 1,024. But we don't want the probability of E complement. What did we want the probability of? We wanted the probability of E, so two or more. So the probability of E by our theorem is equal to 1 minus the probability of E complement. So this is our theorem on probability of complements. So then the probability of at least two heads is 1 minus the probability of one zero heads or one head. So that's 1 minus 11 over 1,024, or 1,024 minus 11 over 1,024, getting a common denominator, or 1,013 over 1,024. So that would be our probability of getting at least two heads. And we found that the only way not to get two heads is to get zero heads or one head, and there were only 11 ways that could happen. So then all of the other 1,013 ways contain at least two heads. So two heads, three heads, four heads, five heads, six heads, seven heads, eight heads, nine heads, or 10 heads. So notice the complement saved us a ton of work. Because if we go back to the very beginning, we would have had to calculate the probability of getting two heads, three heads, four heads, five heads, and six heads, all the way out to 10 heads. So let's investigate. Well, how many ways Can I get two heads? So one head was pretty easy to calculate. But we might want to see, well, what happens if it's not quite that simple? How many spots do we have? We still have our 10 spots. And we have to arrange. two heads and eight tails. So this is just one possibility. In fact, I'm going to change it a little bit. I'll do this one. So one way that we could get two heads would be head, head, and then all the rest are tails. But then my next permutation could be something like heads, tails, heads, and then the rest tails. If I wanted to go through and try to enumerate all of these, there's going to be a lot of them, right? Because I'd first have to move that first one through, and then I'd have to start moving the second one through as well. That's going to be a lot of ways to count all of these things. So does our order matter? Mm -hmm. Right? So how many things are we arranging this time? Oh, I didn't want to erase those ones. So, well, let's see. We have two heads, right? And they need to go somewhere. And then how many tails are we rearranging? Eight, Eight right? So we're going to have 10. We have 10 spots. And we can think of this in either in terms of heads or tails. How many different ways can we arrange two heads in this? We're going to have 10 choose 2. Or what would be the other one? 
Instead of arranging the heads, what could we rearrange? Which would be 10 shoes. How many tails are there? Eight. And if we check that on our calculator, what do we get for each of those? So 10 shoes. And if we do 10, choose 8, what do we get? Oh, same thing. Because it doesn't matter whether we arrange the two heads or the eight tails, everything else goes in the remaining slots. If I arrange the eight tails, then the two heads fit in the blanks. And if I arrange the two heads, then the rest of the tails fit in the blanks. Either way, there are 45 arrangements for two heads and eight tails. And then if you wanted to do it for the next one, well, what would it be? Three heads and seven tails, right? So what would that be? 10 choose three. So if we were going to do it the long way, what would our answer end up being? 10 choose two plus 10 choose 3 plus 10 choose 4 plus all the way out till we get to 10 choose. Well, perfect, 10 choose 10. Because one possibility, the opposite extreme is flipping 10 heads, right? What was our other extreme? Flipping 10 tails. Both of those events are equally likely with a 1 in 1,024 chance. So what do you think if we added up 10 choose 2 plus 10 choose 3 plus 10 choose 4, if we added all of those up, what do you think we're going to get? Well, let's find out. So if we... Go on our calculator and let's go alpha window. Let's take our summation and we're going to let our I go from the summation is under alpha and window. So I goes from 2 to 10 and we want to do 10 choose and we want our i to go from 2 to 10 so 10 choose i and that will add up all of those things and what did we get 1013 where have we seen that number before oh we calculated that indirectly because what was its complement 1 plus 10 gave us 11, and 11 is the complement of 1,013 out of 1,024, right? So we calculated it both ways, and with the help of our calculator, it wasn't terrible to do the summation. Even if you had to type it out, you'd only have to put in nine things, but it is still better to use the complement in cases like this when you can. But if you have to, you can always just directly add up all of the events, right?